morning, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, good day. Welcome to those of you that are here and those of you that are joining us from around the world, wherever you are joining us from at this time. It's good to have you doing that. And the, the goodness comes out of the truth of who the living God is and what he is allowing to be accomplished at this juncture in time. I believe every single person that is alive on the earth today, um, I would even dare say even the person that we would consider insane, they are aware of this truth that there is something happening that is an indication that this world has changed and the change that has taken place it is at a point where we are recognizing that something is about to happen that is beyond the human comprehension or control and even though there are those who are trying trying very hard to stop certain things from happening they realize that they are not capable of doing so I was uh, watching this uh, video on YouTube, um, I think it's about 20 something minutes long, and it's a, a video of the, the Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Mia Motley. Um, she was speaking at the UN, UN Council of Meeting and they were discussing the, I think the main topic that they were discussing was about climate change. She gave a very powerful speech, in my estimation, based on um, the things that she said. And one of the things that she said, you know, I mean, she was, you know, very stern in her, in her, in, her, in her speech, she said, when are we going to wake up as leaders? Because she said, the people are losing faith in the governments of the world because we are making promises and we're never coming through with those promises being fulfilled. And she was emphasizing on climate change and how it's affecting even Barbados, the Caribbean and the world. And she said, the science is clear. And, I, and, I, and I'm listening and I said, okay, you know, everybody's making pledge that they're going to do certain things that by the year 2030, 2040, 2050, we're going to lower, you know, carbon emission and we're going to do this and do all of that. I'm saying all of that to say this, I, I, I'm, I'm, I pity them. Because they have a very... <laughs> Would I use a term, are the words heavy responsibility, in that they are trying to fix something that is not fixable. Because I'm saying to you again, whether you want to believe me or not, it doesn't matter. Do I care? I am a messenger. And my responsibility is to deliver exactly, accurately, and truthfully what the king says. You have a choice. You can choose to believe it or reject it. And if you do, you don't have to deal with me either. You're going to have to deal with the king. You're going to have to deal with the king. Whether or not human had done anything, and I'm not saying that they don't, and I'm not going to give in to this climate thing either. 
and we're not supposed to as God's people to be swallowed up into it. We're not going to jump on a band. If I ever catch one of you out there about your protests, <laughs> we are not supposed to be a part of those things. I'm saying this, that even if there was no using of fossil fuel, um, coal, and all of the stuff that they claim has contributed to climate change. And there's a whole lot of stuff happening in the world. And every time something happens, it's always oh, climate change. It's climate change. Why this is happening? I'm saying this to you, that even if those things were not there for them with their science to say, this is the cause, so you need to get rid of coal, you need to get rid of fossil fuel, you need to get rid of you, this, and you know, we're going to... And, and for what purpose? Think about it. Before I give you the answer, the other part, why are we fighting to do all of this stuff? Huh? To save mama hurt. To save the hurt, right? For what purpose? Hmm. But I'm saying this, that even if that was not a part of what they claim, which I don't believe everything that they say, there are certain things that would and will happen. You know why? From the very beginning of time, you need to understand that what happened, Satan becoming a part of the history of the earth, mankind being on the earth, and everything that we saw transpired after man's sin, God was not taken by surprise. If you read the scriptures carefully, truthfully, you will understand that God, there, nothing can ever take God by surprise. If it take him by surprise, he's not the God that he claims to be. We're talking about the God who knows the end from when. So before time, God knew that certain things was going to happen in time. So God has already put a expiry date on it. That's why even Jesus himself talks about the end of the age. The apostles, the prophets. Prophets, prophets. The scripture I read yesterday in Daniel. Even this morning when I came in, Brother Paul was saying to me, Pastor, thank you. He said, I have never seen that or heard the things that you showed us yesterday. It's, and it, I, did, I did not sneak it in yesterday. It has been there all the time. It's been there all the time. But the church has been dodging the truth because we're so tied up in so much lies. And we're afraid. Some, some, some is not even afraid. They don't know anything better. And I'm saying to us as the people of God, we must be on the side of God. If you fail to be, then you will suffer the consequence. God knew from before he even put it in creation that it's going to be wrapped up. It's going to wrap up like a garment. And notice, if you believe the scripture, in, first, in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, we're looking for what? A new heaven and a new earth. If there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, then the old has to go. God is not going to put a new earth and the old earth. And a new heaven and the old heaven. No, he's going to wipe it away. And then in John, in Revelation, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, the Lord Jesus gave him this revelation. And he wrote, he told him what to do with it. And remember in chapter 21, now we know from chapter 4, John was taken up into heaven by the Spirit. So everything that he's telling us from chapter 4 on, it's from heaven's point of view. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a, as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And he said that the old heaven and whatever, it, it, it passed away. It had to. So we have to believe that. And don't get caught up with this, with people that are in darkness and making decisions in darkness. They will never accept what you even say or tell them. So keep it to yourself. And let it be the anchor of your hope. But the science, even the scientists are aware of the fact that the earth as we know it, it's coming to an end. And the things that they're trying to do to save it won't save it. So I'm not making any plans for it. <laughs> I'm not making any plans for it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Doesn't mean you can't make a nice house. For sure, if you have a need for it, and you are in the position to do so, build it. And yeah, hang out for a while. And enjoy whatever is left of it. But this is not your home. If you believe that it is, then you're saying God is a liar and he's not in control. So let us live for God in that context. We're going to take a moment and pray. And we've been talking about prayer in cap capsule in, in nuggets. <laughs> And I know this is helping a lot of persons, a lot of persons here and abroad. And as I said, even this brother in, um, in Trinidad was talking and he said, Pastor, I need to know how to pray. Wow. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he had ceased praying, that one of his disciples, say disciple. disciple. Say it again, disciple. disciple. Say it one more time, disciple. 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 That's an important word where scriptures are concerned and the order of it should be important to us if we are in Christ, in Christ. And this is key to understanding what I am saying because I'm saying things that you can't find in a verse but the scripture is there to back it. If the disciple comes to the teacher or the master, and, and before I understood, before I got born again and came to be a part of the church and reading the scripture, Sister Kim, I was, I was, I, I, would I call it a fan or whatever? I, I didn't know the, the word or whatever, but I don't want to use the word now because I understand what the word means, but you would use it then without an understanding. I love Kung Fu shows. Oh, my father. And, and, and it got to the point where I even got the books. I was studying the style, the crane, the snake, the tiger. My goodness, the dragon. I, I, and I, had, I, I set up things and I was doing and wow. Then I got born again. <laughs> If I didn't get, if I wasn't, I don't know maybe where I would end up. <laughs> but I noticed even in these, what this, this, these, this was the shows that I saw the concept of discipleship. The monks, the abbots, they had the students. 
And if you notice, they would start out with all the, a lot of the Kung Fu movie goals. You know, the, the teacher would teach this particular student certain styles. Then they go out there and they, they came across the villain and the villain beat them up. That always happened in the movie. And beat them up, and, you know. A time goes on, you know, and they get healed. And then now the master have to teach them another style that he had not taught them before. And he now sees the need to teach them this particular style. To counteract the style of that other person. I remember there, there was this one that I watched. I, don't, I, I, I mean, these are... These, 30 years ago I watched these. I don't even remember their name though. But there was one particular movie where Kung Fu movie where the guy he had this long white hair and when he flashed it, needles would come out of it. And when the needle hits your body, it's like you're paralyzed. <laughs> and the guy had to learn certain styles to now avoid that happening to him again. And the abbot taught him a secret style. And sometimes you find that some of the villains, they were taught by the same master. So in order for the person to beat them, they have to learn something beyond what the master didn't teach them. For instance, any of you watch Kung Fu Panda? <laughs> the first one, number one, because there's number four now. Number one, the villain was Thailand. Remember? Thailand? Thailand or Thailand or something like that. He was trained by Master Shifu, who taught the panda. And notice, the panda was chosen to be the dragon warrior. While Thailand wanted to be the dragon warrior. And there was something that had to be given to the dragon warrior for him to function as the dragon warrior. And it was the secret scroll. Remember where it was? And when it was taken down, there wasn't anything written in it. It was, it was, it was like a mirror you're seeing yourself. So the secret is for you to believe in yourself. And if you notice how he beat him, <laughs> it was really funny. It was not styles that Thailand was taught or thought that he would have used. It was contrary, unconventional. Because remember, in Kung Fu, there is no style that is known as panda. You have crane, you have snake, you have dragon, you have tiger, but there's no panda. <laughs> That's why when he saw him, he laughed and he said, you're a panda. You're a panda. <laughs> but he beat him because he chose to accept what was offered to him by the master. I'm saying all of that to say this. That if we understand that we're disciples of Christ, whatever the father taught him in how he was supposed to pray, because the, the, this, this is so important to prayer and the church continue to reject it and do foolishness that we call prayer meeting, prayer vigil, and prayer whatever. So whatever the father taught him, and he is going to raise up disciples that would be a continuation of who he is, then he had to teach them the same formula. The same formula. If you notice... When they came and asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, he said to them, when you pray, say what? Say what? I mean, I, I, I don't even need to go to the other. This is where it all lies. And when we get this revelation, it completely, radi it completely radicalizes. Is that correct? <laughs> radicalizes your prior life. God wants you and I to see him as father. And that's what we have over Satan. That's what we have over the angels. Angels were created by the same God. But God gave us something that he did not give to the angels. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm not making up stuff. And I'm not reaching for something here. I'm reaching for what is already there. 
Hebrews chapter 1 says, Unto which of the angels God has ever said, You are my? That is something we have over angels. They are spirit beings created for the only purpose of serving. Serving. We were created and given the nature to be a son. Jesus Christ, the Jesus that was praying in the garden, in the, in the, in the place where he was, who was he to God? Who was he to God? So the disciples, when they went to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray, they were talking to the Son of God. And the Son of God wanted them to know that you are also sons. So if you notice what he said, he used the word our, 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 our. Our, when you pray, say our, our, our Abba. You never saw it, huh? Now you're saying, that's why God have me doing this. To open your spiritual eyes, to open your eyes to the truth. So that we pray with power. We pray and engage the Father Every time, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what the situation is, you know exactly what to do in the moment. In the moment. It is not something for us to take lightly. If we do, we will continue to be religious. They went to the master and they said, we have been watching you do certain things. And we watch when you do it, what the outcome, what the results look like. We want that. We want that. Because when you understand how to communicate with God, when you understand how to communicate with God, I don't care what Satan is capable of doing. Because you see, sometimes, sometimes, Marcella, God may choose, may choose to remove the storm or remove you from the storm. But there are those moments, Sister Kim, where God doesn't move the storm or remove you from the storm. He allows you to go through the storm. And you know what is going to keep you grounded in the storm? Because the storm doesn't stop God from speaking to you. And when you can hear God in the storm, that's your anchor. That's your anchor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Elijah was in the cave. And the Bible said, as he was in the cave, you know, contemplating the fact that he was the only one that was left in his estimation. And the Bible said while he was there, an earthquake came. But God was not in it. Fire, but God, fire that came down earlier on, but this fire, God was not in it. Wind, but God was not in it. And he stayed in his position. He said, after that, a still small voice came in the cave from heaven, and it was God. It was God. And when God spoke to him, it shifted everything. And so even as we are in the end of the age, it's not about where we go. It's not about what we have. It's not about who we know, but the God who created the heavens and the earth. And his purposes are being played out. And you understand that you're a part of it. 
And one of the most important things that he wants is for you to be able to hear his voice. His voice makes a difference. When he speaks, he relieves. Stand with me, please. It's the only voice that makes. <sighs> we got to the place in human development that there was a need for certain communication um, devices to come on the scene. It's, it's, it's just amazing when you go back and look at history and see when certain things come to be. It was, it was the right moment. It was the right time. And as population is increasing, spreading across the globe, you know, different continents are being filled up with people. You remember, you're, I, I don't know, you're too young, but you remember the, the, one of the primary mode of communication at one point was you writing a letter, the snail letter. So we had writing pads. We had, you know, the envelopes that you would get and you would go to the post office. It's still, it's still around. But it's some ancient people that still use it. <laughs> then all of a sudden, we got to the point where the telephone. Was it Alexander Graham Bell? 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 He invented, they say, the telephone. And when he did, and I don't remember which president was president then at that time when he did it. And they, he went, you know, they had an exhibition. And the president walked up and said, what contraption is this? And they explained to him, and said, oh, that will never last. Now, look at it. And I'm saying all of that to come to this. In order for you and I to have a communication when I'm distance away, it doesn't matter where, you must have my phone number. And the digits must, the digits, the digits must line up. Because if, you, if, if I give you my number and you miss one of the digits, you can dial it, yes, of course. And in today's world, it's like any number you dial, somebody's going to answer. And so for you to get me, for you to call and know that you're going to get me, you must have my correct number. And the moment you dial it, my phone, my phone, Start to ring. God has given us his digits. We're not so, prayer is not something to joke with because when you're facing certain things, you need to know that when you dial God, you're going to get a response. <laughs> you remember the son says whatsoever you ask the father in my name it shall be done for you so you know why many of us in the church have been saying, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and nothing happening? Because we do not recognize. Because it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus you go to to get your prayers answered. You go through. 
You go through Jesus to the Father. So if you did not recognize the Father, all you are dialed and are put in Jesus, there will be no response. I must recognize the Father in order for me to go through the Son. So I said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it for you so that the Son will be glorified. We're going to talk to the Father in this room today, people. Begin to integrate Father into your thinking, into your thought, into your speech, into your lifestyle. Father, I ask that even as we pray today that you will give us a greater revelation of yourself. It is necessary. Go ahead and talk to him. Go ahead and talk to him. Wow. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. You are my Father. You are our Father. What a, what a wonderful thing it is, Lord, to think that Jesus Christ, Father, is my Father. <laughs> and therefore, whatever you had put in place to support him while he was in time, that support base is still in play because we are here as sons. And he prayed and he said, Father, he said, Father, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I'm asking you to keep them from the evils of the world. My, he said, while I was in the world, he said, while I was in the world, I have kept them and I have kept them through your authority. Now that I'm coming to you, Father, I am praying that you will continue to keep them. The glory that you gave me, Father, I have given it unto them that they may be one, that they may be one even as you and I are one. I in them and you in me make them one. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. This is not something that we're putting on you. This is not something that we're imposing on you. This is not something that we're making up. It is that which you have revealed it's that which you have revealed to us. You gave it to us. You send your son to give us an understanding of who you really are. And for us to understand that when we come to faith in the son, it puts us in a position to be redeemed and restored to be sons of God. Because as many as receive him, the son, to them you gave the right to become sons of God. So with great honor with great honor and dignity I come today and I say Abba thank you thank you that you are my Abba you are Jesus's Abba and you are my Abba and I thank you for daily bread I thank you for daily provision I thank you for daily protection I thank you Lord for everything that you put in place to support me to support us as sons of the living God Sons of the living God. Sons of the living God. Father, I pray that each and every one that have come to be in this room today, that we will have the, an encounter with you. And it's not an encounter that will be of accident, will be of coincidence, but that which you have willed, that which you have purposed for this day. Holy Spirit, we are willing to submit ourselves to your leading so that you will lead us into that which the Father has already put in place for us to experience this day in this room and in the other rooms for, of those that are watching in their bedroom, their living room, their kitchen, whatever room they choose to be watching from. Father, I pray that they will have an encounter in the room. I pray, Father, that, Lord, we will experience your glory at another dimension. We will experience your presence at another dimension because, Father, you are determined to shift us. We must grow, and as we grow and bring forth fruit, you are not even going to leave us at that stage 
you come and you do some pruning because you desire more fruit. So Father, even in this room today, there will be some pruning. There will be some pruning because you desire more fruit. And so Father, we give you permission to prune us. We give you permission to prune us. Prune us, prune us as individuals. Prune us collectively that we will be that city that is set up on a hill giving light and hope to the world giving light and hope to the world we will be the salt we will be the light we will not be talking about it because father one of the things that i notice in the church today that we talk the scriptures and we talk god and we talk but there is no demonstration father we will not say that we are the light we will be the light we will not say that we are the salt we will be the salt because there is a need for it lord show off yourself i pray in the name of the lord jesus that the Holy Spirit will have the freedom to minister to us in the ways that he know that we have need of such ministry. I pray the word will have free course in our minds, in our spirits, and in our lives. And the word will become flesh again. The word will become flesh again. So Father, I ask that your presence courtesy of the Holy Spirit will come and rest upon this room like a blanket. Cover us. Envelop us. And Father, I pray that even as Moses, when he went in, up into the mount and he spent 40 days and 40 nights in your presence, his skin was shining. That which he encountered now dwells in us. Father, may it flow out and may it impact us and all those that are around us as we are the aroma of life to one and we are the aroma of death to another. I pray today, Father, that we will experience such. Thank you for ministering to those that are experiencing grief at this moment, the loss of a mother, a sister, a brother, a grandmother, grandfather, a child, a son, a daughter. I thank you for your comfort. I thank you for your peace. I thank you, Lord, for the supply for whatever need is present in our lives right now. And that the need did not take you by surprise because our Father knows what we have need of even before we ask. So thank you for the supply. And Father, I pray, I pray that where the nations of the world is concerned, in Psalm 2, we're told through a prophetic window that when you decided to establish your son and install him as king, the kings of the earth, the nations, the rulers, the peoples, they set themselves together to take counsel and to rebel against that move. But you laughed. You held them in derision. And you went ahead anyway and established your son. Install him as king. And Father, when you installed him, you said to the son, ask of me. And I will give you the nations. <laughs> I will give you the nations. And so, Father, today, I know that there is a prophetic destiny for every single nation on the face of the earth. Whether they know it or not. And they are playing out your plans and your purposes being fulfilled. As you said to Moses, for this cause I raise up the Pharaoh, I raise up Pharaoh, that the earth may know that I am the Lord, because all the earth is mine. All the earth is mine. So Father, let your plans and purposes for Canada and for us as the church, we should know that we are the custodians 
of your grace, the custodians of your authority and your power and your glory in the nation. And so, fathers, we are in Canada, and there are those that are in the United States and other parts of the world. I pray that they will come into this understanding that the creation where they are is groaning, travailing, and expecting a manifestation. May we come in. May we be clothed. May we grow up and become mature sons of God. So let it be, Father. So let your will be done. Let your will be done. And Father, even when we think of the wars going on, Russia and the Ukraine, Israel and Hamas, now they're on the verge of being in conflict with Iran and others are going to engage. Father, how do we pray where all of that is concerned? Because Father, it's a part of the signs of the time. So all I am saying to you, that where Israel is concerned and the rest of the world, let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth, even as it is already established in heaven. So be it, Father. So be it. So be it. So be it. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and thank you for answering as we give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise because you are worthy. By your will, by your will, all were created. And for such, Father, receive all the glory. In Christ's name we pray and tell you thanks because we believe that we have received. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you can, please. Wow. Um, we're going to continue our reading in this precious book called the book of Revelation. So yesterday we, uh, we stopped at what, five? It was five, right? So today... We're going to read chapters, chapters 6 and 7. They're short chapters. Chapters 6 and 7. And I want to remind you of about something I said, uh, I think was last Sunday and yesterday and today. I want to repeat myself where that is concerned. Even persons that have never read the book of Revelation has a certain fascination about it. That just the name, you know, Revelation. <gasps> oh my God. Have you heard about da da da? And we are quoting things out of context. We're taking things to be literal where it's not literal, it's symbolic, and making a mess, making a mess of it. I want you to get rid of everything, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that will give you permission to do that and reset our thinking. Everything that was told to you about the book, put it aside right now. And if there's anything that is even true after you really see it for what it is. Go back and see what you can now salvage from whatever you put aside. But do not continue to approach the book in the way that it has been handed down even out of tradition to us. It is a wonderful book. And it's supposed to be very important to the church. Because something that Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, I think he said it in John. He said... While, watch this, while he was here in the body of Jesus before he went to the cross, he said, of that day and hour, no man, listen, no man knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man. Son of Man is referring to 
himself. Do you know that there are preachers still preaching that? They said not even Jesus, no, no. I was in a conversation last week with a gentleman that is supposed to be a Christian. He said that. You know what? I kept silent because I'm meeting this man for a few minutes. He has kept this for how many years of his life. I would have to have time to sit down and school him and if he will receive it. And when I heard him, I said, oh God, this is the state of the church. What we must understand about the book of Revelation, after Jesus made that statement before the cross, he died, was buried, rose again, and ascended into heaven. Is after he rose from the dead, God gave him the revelation. And the revelation is about the end time. So the day and hour that he did not know before, now he knows. And what did he do? He sent and signified to his servant John that was in the Elopatmos by watches, by angels that he said did not know. Because if you're going to send a message with angels, it means that angel is now getting the knowledge. And then he sent it to John when he said, no man no. So John now know. And then he said, John, write to the churches. So we need to know this. What Jesus said then was true. But something happened that changed it, that it doesn't remain true anymore. Chapters 6 and 7 of the book of Revelation. Go ahead, my sister. Good morning, everyone. Revelation 6. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Mm -hmm. And I heard one of our four living creatures saying with a voice, like thunder come and see and I look and behold a white horse he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer when he opened the second seal I heard the second living creature saying come, come and see, see. Wow. come and see mm -hmm. Another horse, fiercely red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, hmm. and that people should kill, should kill one another, hmm. and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come, come and, and see, see. Hmm. and I look, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scale in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for, for a denarius, and a three quart of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Hmm. And he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Ardes followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the herd mm -hmm. to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the herd. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the halter the souls of those who has been slain for the word of God <laughs> and for the testimony which they held. Wow. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the hurt. Then a white robe was given to each of them. Yes. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were completed. I looked when he opened the fifth seal and mm -hmm. behold, there was a great earthquake, earthquake. and the sun became black as sack 
clot of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree dropped its late fig when it was shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolling up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, mm. every slave, and every free man hid themselves in the cave in the rock of the mountain. Hmm. And he said to the mountain and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him hmm. who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Amen. Who is able to stand? Wow. Revelation 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. <laughs> And he cried with a yes. loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judea, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of God, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Mm -hmm. Of the tribe of Nepali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of that word, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Ishkar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zubilon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. After these things, mm -hmm. I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, mm -hmm. tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belong to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Mm. Blessing and glory and wisdom thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are these array in white robes? Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. And I said to him, sir, you know, <laughs> so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, yes. they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. 
for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to live in fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Thank you. It's very important when you're reading the scriptures that you pay careful attention to every letter, every word, every sentence, because if you don't, people can tie you up. Even yesterday, I made mention that there will be no rapture. I mean, when, when you say something like that, you know, <gasps> you hear all a sound in internet world. What? If you notice, after the 144,000 was sealed, and if you notice, it told you where those 144,000 came from. They are from the tribes of Israel. God knows exactly who are the true Israelites. So those black people where grow a long beard and I do whatever you do. Stop your nonsense. And, it, and being a Jew doesn't matter when you're in Christ. There is neither. Come on, people, don't let the deceptive demons that are so rampant today take you away. After the 144,000 are sealed, notice he says, after these things, I saw, I saw, notice, you know, I saw, I behold a multitude that no man could number. And one of the things that you need to pay attention to, he said, when the question was asked to him, who are they? Where are they coming? He said, you know, sir. And he told, these are those who have came out of what? So if we're ruptured, how are we coming out of tribulation? This is the end time. Because if you notice... After the seals are being opened, the seals, we, we, we first introduced to the seal in chapter 5. And when the seals, number one seal open, we see the white horse. Seal number two, we see the white horse, the, the, the black horse. Seal number three, we see the fiery red horse. Seal number four, pale horse. And fifth seal open and sixth seal open. And we see when the sixth seal was opened, there were angels that were sent with authority to do what? To withhold the winds from blowing under. I wonder if that's why the Caribbean gets so hot. <laughs> Holy mama. Even the last time I went to Jamaica in 2019, whoo, I said, is this Jamaica that I was living in? I said, I want to go home. <laughs> it was It was hot. And Caribbean is a place where normally you have nice, cool sea breeze blowing, man, and you're drinking June plum juice and chilling. The angels were given the authority to withhold the breeze from blowing on the earth and do certain things to the trees and so on. And notice in the midst of that, God sent another angel and said, hold off. Do not do it until we seal the servants of God. So the 144,000 are sealed. And then after that, there is this multitude of people. I'm, if I'm alive, I'm going to be in that multitude. <laughs> if you're alive, please be in that multitude. And notice, they came out of great tribulation. But watch this. They washed their robe. Hallelujah. White in the blood of the Lamb. And they are standing before what? The throne of God. So it's not defeat. It's not gloom and doom. 
Because remember, even in chapter 6, it talks about when one of the seal was unlocked. It talks about the souls of those who died for the word of God. And they are saying to the Lord, how long? How long until you avenge our blood and those on the earth? And he said, wait a little. I'm going to avenge you, but wait a little. Because there is some more that is supposed to experience the same thing like you. So I'm waiting for them to come in before I take any action. Would you, if, if you know that you're going to die for the word of God, would you be afraid of dying? Why? Why? Because you will never taste the sting of debt. If you know that you are immune to the sting of a scorpion or a snake, would you be afraid of the snake? <laughs> Honey badger, um, and there are certain animals, they're immune to snake. Venom, and they're immune to the, 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 the venom of a scorpion. So they see that scorpion. The scorpion better run from them because they actually eat the scorpion. You and I, we eat debt. Debt is swallowed up in what? Victory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, debt, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? So if God have it that I am a part of that number that will die for his word, so be it. So be it. No fear, no worry. Because, listen to me, when you die, when you die before the Lord even come, it is a special, it is a special thing. Because remember, when he return, it's the dead in Christ that will have first row. You know, when you go to the theater, which part of the theater you, you, you choose to sit in when you go to the theater? Depends on your height. Depends on. <laughs> but I love to sit at the back. At the back. That's where I choose my seat. So if I select, uh, if I'm doing it online or if I go, I choose that. And sometimes you go and you full up and say, oh, well, you know. But those who die in the Lord before you return, you're going to have front row. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, if I'm alive, I'm going to be envious. And, and then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up to gather to meet him in the air. To meet him in the air. So where is the fear? Where is the worry? Death, bring it on. And you better handle me with respect. Because my Lord has already conquered you. And he has the keys. He has the authority. Wow. Isn't the word of God sweet? That's the only thing I can find to compare to right now. It's sweet. Really sweet. My goodness. Today... I wanted to announce this last week. <laughs> Completely slipped me. And did you say anything about it online? <laughs> Natalie actually sent me a message in the morning on Tuesday to remind me to ask you to say something online because I know like for the person that are watching, we want to you know, give them a heads up so that they prepare themselves. But even you didn't get any heads up, you don't need no special thing. If you have some, even soda, I don't even, I don't believe in pop, but if you have pop, pop it, pop it. And crackers, whether it's grandma crackers, I don't know, just anything. And even if you don't have no crackers and you have a piece of dumpling, I'm serious, because it's not the thing, it's what it represents, all right? Yesterday, when I came in while we're here, and Damien came up and said, Pastor, remember the... And I, it just slipped. And I said, you know what? God may have it that I don't say anything because for some people, they will show up just because we say we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. You should be always ready. 
ready. So I am now halting between two opinions. Should we do it before I start teaching or do it after I teach? Because when I start teaching, I start out with a 45 caliber, but then I get into the middle and I switch that to an M60, and then you get down into it and I switch it out to a... <laughs> what, what, what you call that one that you... You, 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 um, the surface to here missile that they use to take down planes. So sometimes all in my teaching me, I'll reach a center because I have to take down some principalities and some powers. So I'm kind of, anyway, you think I should do it now? Give you the word first. <laughs> all right. Do we have anyone visiting with us today for the first time? Say a hand. Could you just stand for a minute, please? Stand for a minute, please. Anyone else? Stand, please, for a minute, sir. I got them all. Oh, yep, at the top there. Anyone else? Okay. Lady in the red first, your first name, Doreen, Doreen, Noel, oh, Sean, Audrey, oh, may I ask who invited you? Sister Joyce White, okay, is she here? Okay, may I ask who invited you? Leslie? Ah, I know her. <laughs> Sean? Michael? Micah. Micah. Oh! <laughs> okay. And Audrey, who invited you? You met Marva yesterday in the washroom. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yesterday in the washroom. <laughs> wow. Bless you. I am going to ask someone, five or so of you, to give them a welcome hug. The rest of you put your hands together for them. Wow. Wow. So even in the washroom, <laughs> you have to behave yourself even when you're in the washroom because you never know. You never know. <laughs> so good to have you. And I pray that as you come, you will receive something from the precious hand of the Lord today. Um, quickly, um, in way of announcements, um, our baptism coming up, we plan for it from when, when, now the time is getting closer. Our next baptism on the 18th of May. Um, the next thing, um, our royal gathering, July, barbecue and stuff going on. Oh, wow. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the, win to the winter being over. Oh, Father, please. I know signs of the times are, you know, but... <laughs> so, as we get a little closer to it, we will do some more things in preparation of such. And then this weekend, this weekend, it's our Montreal... Matro Montreal, Mo, M O Montreal, which means Royal Mountain, Mount Royal. It's a wonderful place we're going, teaching kingdom. We're going to 
the royal mountain to preach the kingdom. Jesus went up into the mount. Wow. So it's this weekend, and yesterday we also put out the word, so I want to put it out again. As I said, no pressure, so please don't feel pressure in any way. But if you are coming or going, um, they want to get a number of the amount of person that will be there. I know some of you are coming up for the Sunday meeting, and then there are those going up from Friday. So they want to have a number so that they can prepare a meal for the Sunday evening after the meeting. So they need a number. So if you were here yesterday, you would have given that information. If you're here today and you weren't here yesterday and you're going, please pass on the information to Marlon or Danet or even Trisha so that we can give them a number starting tomorrow because we're in the week. And by the time you... By the time we finish and walk out of the door, it's Friday. So, we want that number today. Today is the cutoff. And yes, be reminded that there will be no meeting here. You can meet here, but <laughs> we won't be here. So... Another thing also, the streaming will start at 1.30 because of their schedule there. So even those of you online, make a note of it. That That's the only time, of course, that will happen. After that, we go back to our regular um, programming. <laughs> so please keep that in mind. And... Um, the men's meeting, general men's meeting for the year 2024, the first one, will be on the 11th of May. The 11th of May. I think we're still working out the logistics of the place and so on, so we will um, update you on that as we get closer to the time. Um, I think that covers everything for now. The woman, yeah, woman in the kingdom. It's June eighth. Okay, June eighth. Okay. <laughs> so, woman in the kingdom, June eighth, and men in the kingdom, May eleventh. Make it a date. I'm looking forward to the meeting with the men. There's a word that the Holy Spirit has already deposited in my spirit to release. And my prayer and hope is that whoever comes, they will really receive what the Spirit is saying to us in these days. I have a word for the women too. So the women need to invite me. <laughs> they need to invite me to your gathering. Um... Because we're going to be doing that, let me share the word, and then we will do it at the end. Is that okay? <laughs> did, did the child say no? I hope she, he or she is not hungry, so parents, check on them. Um, yesterday, I said it, and um, for those that are being invited, I keep on reminding you to prepare them, because this is not church as usual. We cannot continue to have church as usual. Based on the present state of the church, God is, and I, I remember hearing them making this statement a lot in Jamaica, and at the time it didn't make sense, much less to even make faith. And they would say, God is taking the church out of the church. And I said, what are you talking about? When I get to this point and look at the state of the church, I realize that the church, God has to take it out. 
And this is where he says, come out from among them. Be separate unto me and I will be your God. I will be your father. Let me remove this because as I teach, something else is going to flow out. Um, and I was saying that one of the things that of, uh, you know, quite a few persons, persons watching online, persons come in here and they say, oh, they don't sing. And it shows you something that I have been saying or the spirit has been saying through me. That we're singing in church today is concerned. It has literally become an idolatry. That people would walk away from where the word is being taught to find a place where they sing a lot. And we need to understand that singing is not as important as the word. The word takes precedent all the time. Jesus never sing a lot. You, re, you notice that it's only one time the Holy Spirit allowed it to be recorded that Jesus sang a hymn. You remember when? When they had the last supper together and he was about to go into the garden, the Bible said they sang a hymn. That's the only time the scripture make record of it. He, they, they didn't focus on singing. But the church has been taken down a path where it's about entertainment and convenience and comfort. So we want people to feel good. And if I want you to come back next week so that the offering bin can be filled up, I am going to make sure that I entertain you. Because if you go to a club and you weren't entertained the way you thought that you would have been, what do you leave the club and say? What, what's the word that the young people would use now? Oh, you don't know? <laughs> what's the word that they would use? You don't know? Thank God. <laughs> he said they would say the club wasn't bumping. Do you know about the bumping? <laughs> they say it's back in your days. <laughs> but there are certain words that they would use. And, 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 and notice, notice the church has gotten to the point where what I have noticed and God allows me to see it. Because I've seen something about worship that the church doesn't want. It doesn't want to hear it and it will never receive it even if I release it. What the church has done is that we say, okay, we're no longer in the world. But we're going to take what the world have and we're going to godize it. Is that a word? <laughs> we put God on it so the world has concert we take it and we call it gospel concert right because we say we, we're not in the world anymore but, but, but we need to have something you know to keep us going come on people look at the scriptures carefully there is no entertainment in God. Hear what one of the scripture concerning the end time says. Paul says, the spirit spoke expressly that in the latter days, you know what would happen? Men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And it's being fulfilled right in the very church. And I'm saying, God said to me, you cannot be a part of that. 
and those whom I have raised you up to lead, you cannot lead them down that path. Because it will not, it will not help us. So, I want you to know this. That when it comes to your walk with God, faith is important and there is nothing entertaining about faith. What faith does, it brings you into the life of God. It gives you access to who God is and what God wants you to come into. A couple of weeks back, now we're in April, March, February, February, I think it was February, my wife and I went somewhere to get some information about something. When we went there, um, where we went, it's the, the people are what you would say, they're Christians. And in the conversation, they asked us where our church is. Because they found out that we, you know, they call me Christian, but I don't like the Christing. They said, where is the church? You know, and my wife told him, I said, oh, that's, you know, that's a distance. They said, oh, we go to church too. And the husband went on to say this. And I left thinking about it. And I said, Father, that's exactly what church has come to be today. He said, we used to go to a particular place. And then he said, now we're going to this place. And he said, the reason why we're going there, they have some nice programs for children. But now church has become a daycare. He did not say we go because of the word. We go because they have some nice programs for the children. And so, you know, we go. And I'm saying, is that what church should be about? When you read the scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when the people come around Jesus, what was the main thing why they come around him? And when Jesus received them, what did the scripture said he did? He received them and preached to them the things concerning the kingdom of God. The Old Testament, the book, you look at the, the what, what was the primary thing was the word. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to Amos. The word of the Lord came to Obadiah. The word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came to John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3. The word, the word, people. We need to come back to the place. And if you have never been there, you need to get to that place where the word of God is the most important thing in your life. Because Jesus himself quoted quoted from Deuteronomy and what did he say man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God now after that there is nothing else I can do for you to help you if you still want to be entertained I want to touch on just one of this um, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 Romans chapter 1 verse 17 Galatians chapter 3 verse 11 and uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38 all four verses say this what are we looking at again? What are we looking at? Is faith important? How important is it? 
And those four passages that I just referred to, they are all saying this, the just shall live by faith. Listen to Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 from the complete Jewish Bible and English version. It says in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Habakkuk, I will stand at my watch post. I will station myself on the rampart. I will look to see what God will say through me. I will look to see what God will say through me and what I will answer when I am reproved. Then Adonai answered me. He said, write down the vision clearly on tablets of stones so that even a runner can read it. The King James Version said, write the vision and make it plain so that he who is running can read it. So it says, you're going to write it in such a way that even a person that is running while they're running, because when you're running, you're moving a bit faster than you're walking. So it's a write it in such a way that even the runner can be running and read it. It says... So that even a runner can read it. It's a four, verse three says, for the vision is meant for its appointed time. For the vision is meant for its appointed time, which God is the one who would set that time. It says it speaks of the end and it does not lie. It may take a while, but wait for it. It may take a while, but wait for it. That's in faith. It will surely come. It will not delay. And verse 4 says, look at the proud. He is inwardly not upright. But the righteous, remember? King James Version said the just, that's what the word just mean. The righteous shall, will attain, the righteous will attain life through trusting faithfully. Through trusting faithfully. Because faith in God means to trust God. And you only trust someone when you know their credibility. For Bell, and I'm talking about the, the phone and whatever service, it, and, and Bell and Rogers and Fido and Hudo and Hudo. You notice when they're going to credit you, they're going to trust you their service because they start out with them trusting you. You notice the first thing they do? They check your credibility. Not your integrity. They, che they check your credit score. For what purpose? To see if you are in a position to pay them for their service. What happens if they check your credit score and it didn't? It's not good. They ain't giving you the service. That condition, credit score. Who came up with the idea? But I'm using that weak analogy for you to understand. Many of us say we trust God, but do we really trust him? You will talk to people and, and most people will say, oh, I have faith in God. Because if I didn't have faith in God, I wouldn't be here. I mark a... I wouldn't be here, but I have faith in God. Do you really have faith in God? Faith in God means to trust him, rely on him. 
You will not trust someone until you really know them. Some of you say you trust me. Some of you say you trust me. How many, how many of you trust me? Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marlon. <laughs> Trisha, uh, quite a few hands go up there now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Start sweat. <laughs> Next question. Why do you trust me? Because you know my spirit. Mm, that's a good answer. Why do you trust me, Marcella? God showed you who I am. Mm, that's a good answer. Because you ought to trust whomever God placed in your life as your leader. You must trust him. Did Elisha trust Elijah? Did Joshua trust Moses? Huh? Did Esther trust Mordecai? Did, did Ruth trust Naomi? That even to the point when Naomi said, my daughter, go back to your people. Go back to your God. Go. Why would you want to come with me? Even if I could get pregnant and have a child, would you even wait for that child to grow up to get another husband? Go back. And Oprah kissed her mother-in-law and said, au revoir. I'll see you. But the scripture says, but Ruth cling to her. And Ruth says, entreat me not to go back from following you. Because where you go, I will go. And where you dwell, I will dwell. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And if anything that is going to separate us is death. And the Bible says, Naomi, stop telling her to go back. What did Ruth saw in her mother-in-law? To the point where it put her in a very unique position where she became the great, great grandmother of the greatest king that Israel ever had, King David. If you don't know God, you cannot say, I have faith in God. For many people, that's a religious statement. It's a religious statement. And we need to check ourselves that when I say I have faith in God, because you know why I'm emphasizing on this? Why the Holy Spirit will even have me to say this? Listen, there is going, if it hasn't happened yet, I promise you, if you live beyond today, there is going to come some moments in your life that you can just say, I have faith in God. You need to know that you have faith in God. Because there are certain things that shows up in your life that no man, I mean no man can do anything about it. But faith in God changes it. Faith in God changes it. <laughs> faith in God changes it. So now, the aim of this teaching is to bring us to this place where we release faith easily. Easily. I'm going to use another analogy and move on. Um, you were born in Jamaica? Can't talk to you. Wrong candidate. You were born in Jamaica? We're in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So on paper, they have you all over the place. But St. Thomas, I have, uh, I have one of them at home. I, I purchased it and I said I wanted to keep it to show Emmanuel what we used to do in Jamaica for sky juice or um, bag juice, I used to call it, where, where they would share the heist. And then they squeeze out the, the syrup and what did what did you call it? Snow snow cone. But they had the big block of ice. And they I mean hard work. And then there are certain times when you buy a certain drink and they didn't share the ice, they had an ice pick. And they would chip that ice to put in there. Now today. I know a lot of you have it. I have a refrigerator that you connect to the water main, the water line, and the fridge, the refrigerator makes cube heist. And when I don't want the cube, Emmanuel learned how to do it long, long time. You get Crush ice. No more ice pick. Tick, 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 tick. Because it was dangerous, you know. If you don't know what to use, you can harm yourself. And no more working where you have to be. You just press a button and you hear. And you're gone. What, 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 what is that? It's ease. Of comfort it's convenient especially when you're living in a country like Canada you do not have no time for go look for no ice brick and go take out one piece of ice or go in at the deep free if you go ticket up man forget if you put in one cup by the time you do all of that a whole heap of time gone and that's why we see things the way that it is here and I thought that I would have never been a part of such a thing. Do you know how many coconut, iron eye man grit, and iron eye man blood mix up in other coconut? That's why the rice and peas were so nice. You grit off you. Because you are trying to get that little piece of down to you know, and grit off your finger. Blood. <laughs> today, today, today. When, when, last, when last any of you have great coconut? Oh, yesterday. Oh, you did? Oh, wow. My, well, you know, somebody want to, you know, be reminded of where they're coming from. But, but, but today, you don't have to. You go into the store, they have it in tin, they have it in bags, they have it in powder, they have it in brick, they have it in everywhere. Convenience, ease. That you don't have to go through the hard work. And I'm saying all of that to come to this. That God intends for you and I to operate in faith. Easy. By faith Abraham left. Not knowing where he was going. By faith the elders have obtained a good report. Having their testimony that they Please, God, by faith, Abel offer unto God a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, by faith, by faith, Isaac, Isaac, by faith, Jacob, by faith, Moses, by faith, Joshua. And these persons came to the place, they started out, they started out like all of us. Sister Kim, they start out where you would say it was rocky, but we watch them. They got to the place where they no longer stagger in faith. That's where I want to bring you. That's where I want to bring you. Can we go there? Do you want to go there in the first place? Do you believe that that is possible?
I don't want to stay too long because we have something else. But this, this, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to go. Not here, no. But I'm passing through here. And you have to look at it. This is where you run and while you're running, you read. This is what faith is not in God. Number one, positive thinking, positive speech. Even if, even if there is a similarity to it, it is not what faith is. Notice the word positive. Come on. Who doesn't like positive? Hmm? Positive? Which time in your life you don't like positive? <laughs> there, there's a moment in your life or some moments in your life where you do not want the thing to be positive. Right? You want it to be negative. Hmm? Right? But we need to really stop and pay attention to this because there was a time in my life when that was what was operating and I call it faith. And it didn't work for me where God was concerned. Blind faith is where people think that I can, you know, as I said, there are those who say I have faith in God, but they don't know God. Blind faith. God wants you. The reason why, I'm going to show you. The reason why God gave us faith is for us to do what? The first thing is not so much to get things from him. Because when you know God, you understand where provision comes from for you. Faith is for you to know God. So it's not blind faith. And it's not a leap of faith where you're going to do something that cannot be proven. That's not faith in God. And number four, faith has absolutely nothing to do. Pinch the person beside you, please. Not hard, but. <laughs> what happened a while ago? What happened? Did you feel it? You felt it? And some of you did it hard. You, you should not have done that. <laughs> she told you, not hard. Faith, listen to me, people. I'm not here to lead anybody astray. God forbid. Faith has absolutely nothing to do with your feeling. The only commonality that they have in common is that they both start with the same letter. But they have nothing, nothing. Faith has nothing to do with your senses. It has nothing to do with your senses. Because if you look at the reality or the truth of what it says about Abraham. Abraham left by faith. Abraham left not knowing where he was going. That's based on your senses that you want to hear, you want to see, you want to... Now, now we, we, look, look. Um, today, the world has become a global market. And as a result of this global market, we have, we are familiar. It's now a part of our life. Online Shopping. You can buy anything. You can buy a man in line. You can buy a woman in line. Um, I'm sorry, but it's the truth, right? You can buy anything. 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 Wow, that's dangerous. You want to buy a man and come cardboard, stamp, pack, ship, when you look at it from China. <laughs> Now, one of the things that we rely on when we're shopping online, because we know that there is one of the biggest fraud activity that is now in operation in our world, it's online. 
And therefore, when we go even on Amazon, Amazon, you know, Amazon, you can be purchasing stuff from a thief. A thief. There are stores on Amazon that the products are stolen and sold on Amazon. My God, dangerous. Anyway, one of the things that helps you when you're shopping online, you go down and you look at the reviews. Reviews. So you're not buying the thing blindly. You're not buying the thing just because it's there. You want to see if there's any credibility to it. So you check the reviews, and then it's still dangerous. Reviews are muddy water, muddy waters, because companies are paying people. Jesus Christ, I, 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 I'm looking forward to, for you to come back. This corrupt world, you can't even trust the reviews. Because companies are paying people to go on there and write reviews. And you are now thinking that because they have so many five-star reviews, that the product is good. And when it comes to you, you realize that it's not what you purchase. Anyway, too many of us have come across for years, and even in this room today, that we bring faith down to our feelings, and it's trapping us. People, how you operate in faith, I'm going to jump ahead of myself a little here, but I'm going, I'm, I'm going to go there down the road, because we need to deal with that scripture very carefully, because it has been taken out of context. The faith of God is based on God's word. Notice, so God speaks. And when you hear what God says, out of obedience, you act upon it. And God is now faithful to fulfill what he says to you. That no have nothing to do with your feelings. So what is important is you hearing. So obedience is integral to faith. Because you're going to hear God say something and you believe it and obey it. And God bring it to pass because he cannot lie. You remember when God called Abraham and told him to leave his father's country, his land and so forth. And by faith he left. Even after Abraham left, along the way, God tested him. You remember? What was the test? God asked him to bring his only son, Isaac, whom he loved, and offered him as a sacrifice. Did you think that Abraham was doing that out of feelings? This is his only son, the son of promise. That God told him that Sarah would have... And she had that child after she passed the time of childbearing, barren from day one. And now this is the only one. And God is asking you to come and offer him as a sacrifice. And brother, sisters, he was really going to kill him. He put him on that altar. He bound him. He took the knife and he was going to kill him. And God said, Abraham. <laughs> it's a good thing he wasn't Pentecostal. <laughs> when God called him, he says, here am I, Lord. And God said, do not lay your hand on the child. For now I know that you fear me. What caused Abraham to do what he did? God told him. He heard it and obeyed him. That's where many of us, I'm not saying that some of you don't have the faith that God wants you to have, but where it becomes a barrier, it's that you're, you're not willing to obey the instructions that are given to you. In 2003, I came to Canada. I was visiting then. And I preached in a convention in Toronto. At the ending of the convention, the Sunday night, I would have left the Monday morning to go home. Sunday night I finished preaching and I walked down. They have two steps down at, at where the podium. And as I stepped down, 
and my feet hit the floor, the level floor going, I heard the Lord said, it is time. No, that wasn't it. That was when the Lord gave me the word first. The Lord told me that I would have a ministry in Canada. I kept that in my spirit for years without even telling my wife. And in 2007, the Lord said it was time. Notice, he told me in 2003, so that's the conception. I am now pregnant with it. You better listen to me because that pregnancy, if I didn't carry it, nobody would be sitting in this room today. None of you would be hearing me. Right? And I kept it because I believe by then I knew the voice of God. I know God at a point that I could not deny that it was God that was speaking to me. 2007, God said, it's time. Time, time, 2008, rather, to time. And I said, time, and then the Holy Spirit reminded me of 2003. Right away, I knew what he meant. I went home, came back up about a month or two later, to get information of how, you know, to start a ministry in Canada and so on. And what I'm trying to show you, if I was not obedient, imagine people, imagine if I had disobeyed God. What would have been the consequence? Not only would I be hurt, look, what, 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 what are you looking at me? It's my, you're sitting in my obedience. Yeah. You're in this room and many of your life are being impacted. Many of you are growing. Many marriages are transformed and have been transformed. It's because of obedience. Watch me and learn. Don't only hear what I say, but watch my life. The possibility is if I did not obey God, some of you would be in the psych ward right now. Some of you would have been dead. Some of you would have been lost. Some of you were in ministries and tied up in bondage. And God is setting you free right now. Obedience. Obedience. Where am I going with this? You know how many times many of you cause some people to experience some things because God told you. God spoke to you about certain things. And because of your shyness, feelings, because of your in, your, in what you, you're being intimidated, and all, you hold back and what they should experience did not happen. Because when God purposed you to be a part of something happening, there's nobody else yet. That's why there is a judgment. That you will be judged for your works. You need to listen. Watch. If I, if I am your pastor, watch me. I do not disobey God. Anything God wants me to say, that's what I'm going to say. Anything he wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Because I know that your life, where your life is concerned, that's important. Trust, trust. And that's what even encouraged me more and more and more and more and more. When I see, sometimes when some persons talk to me, there are some things that I, I don't even remember until they come in the moment and they say, do you remember this? I said, what are you talking about? They say, oh, so many years ago, you did so many weeks ago, so many months ago. I was at um, a home. Was it, there was family day, family day? Family day was in February. I was at a home, my wife and I and some other person. I think it was family day. Think, think, think it was family day. Which other long weekend came out of family day? The Easter one? Mm. And while we're at the home, 
a mother came in with her two children, somebody that I met when we were at, at um, what's the other one after advance? Midway. And the lady, you know, we're there for a while, and the lady came over to me and she said, Pastor, I had told sister so-and-so to tell you, and I don't know if she told you. She said, do you remember my son? I think the son is now 17, 18, or 19, or something like that. And so when I met him then, he would have been maybe about 10 or something like that. He had a skin condition that is... Um, um, Michael Jackson was affected by that skin condition. V vertiligo. V vitiligo. Verti, viti. And she said, Pastor, do you remember when I came, she was visiting, and it was, as she talked, it, it, I, said, I said, I didn't, I was in the room with her, the boy came in, you know, grown up. I never, believe you me, I did not remember anything until she started to talk. And she said, Pastor, you remember when we came and I brought my son to you? And I said, oh, it's coming back to me now. And I even said, I said, I remember that Sunday. It was after the meeting, Leslie. I was in the area where they had the nursery. You remember the nursery and the, that's where I was standing going to change my shirt. And she came out going out because remember we had the two doors and she's going out. And that's when she came over to the side and she asked, she told me about the condition and she said, you know, could you pray for him? I laid my hands, no preaching, nothing going on, meeting over and I prayed. She said, pastor, that thing was so bad that the doctor says this and that and that and this would have happened and he would have to be doing this and all of that. And she said, Pastor, within, after you prayed for him, within four months, it dried up, it disappeared. She said, look at him now. You look at him, you cannot tell that such a thing was there. God uses people to touch people and in order for people to touch people for God obedience is the key don't think preaching it doesn't it's not given to all of you and some of you were think about even preaching forget it because we think that the only way God can use us is for us to preach. You think this is a easy thing? Do you understand the judgment that is pronounced upon a preacher that preached the word of God wrongly? Have you read James chapter 2? It actually discouraged. It, hear what James chapter 2 says. Let there not be many teachers among you. That's what it says. Because he who teaches the word and teaches it wrongly will have the greater judgment. That's what the scripture says. And a lot of you all, some of you women, where God, know, it's not in the order of God for a woman to preach. And you are running down. And preaching wrongly. Telling people nonsense. And leading people astray. Judgment is already activated against you. And many of you don't like me because I speak the truth. Touch me. It is nowhere in the biblical order of things for a female to preach the word. Order. Look at me. If you want to leave the ministry and go get RD and go. Do I care? Judgment. And many of you, you don't even stop to think about, oh, pastor, pastor need to stop preaching some of the things that he's preaching. Am I preaching my own thing? Everything I preach, you can go to the scripture and the scripture jump and say, yes, it is so. Let there not be many teachers among you. Because the one who teaches the word must be able to bridle his whole body. And we have a lot of people preaching the word and their penis is unruly. Their vagina is a convenience store. 
and then come and come preach. The Bible said those who preach the word, they must be able to bridle their whole body. You can control your penis. You can control your vagina. You can control your mouth and your finger and your tongue. How many preachers how many preachers gone to prison? How many preachers are being in fraud? How many preachers have to be leaving the pulpit because they are caught in all kind of sexual immorality? The time has come for the church to repent and get in order. This is not a joke. You see the teaching that I started yesterday? I beg of you. If you say that I am your pastor, because I don't care and I'm not happy for people to call me pastor. If you call me pastor, it must be true. If you call me pastor, it must be true. I do not want a title because, you know, my head is going to swell up or I'm going to be put in a certain position. It must be true if you call me pastor. If I am not your pastor, call me Bobby or call me dog. I will not be offended. The teaching that I saw tomorrow, yesterday... There is a part of that teaching that I know without a shadow of a doubt. It's going to bring us to this place for us to understand clearly what God has put in place to properly father his children so that every single one of you, Sister Alicia, every single one of you, Trisha, Brother Patrick, every single one of you, grow up exactly the way God wants you to grow up. Grow into exactly what God wants you to grow into. Because we have a renegade church. We have people, they, are, they have no spiritual father. Every person in Christ, God has provided a spiritual father for you. And if you do not have a spiritual father, you are a bastard. And that's dangerous. You know why many of you don't submit yourself to chastisement, correction, discipline? Because you're an orphan. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, children, come on, come on Bible scholars, Come on, you all know it. Children, obey your parents and watch what you miss. Watch what you miss. Watch what you miss. It ends in saying this. In the Lord. You know what that means? That's your spiritual parent. Because the second part says... Children obey. Watch this. Notice now. Because the first part, and, and God, the first part that God starts out with is the spiritual parent. The spiritual parents is of greater value than the biological parents. And then God touched on the biological parents. He said, obey your father and your mother. Watch this. That your days, so that's now talking about your biological parents, that your days may be long upon the earth. Some of you have never paid attention. You can go right now. You can turn there and look at it for yourself. It has always been there, but we keep on missing it because it depends on who we submit to feed us. And some of us don't submit to people to father us. We just simply want information so that we can go and argue. first thing God says, obey your parents in. Your biological parents can also be <laughs> bless you. You are welcome. She said, thank you for being my spiritual father. Your biological parents can be your spiritual parents too. That is if they are born again. And many of us know that we have biological parents that they are not born again. So they could never be your spiritual parents. Your biological parents, if they are born again and are mature enough, they become both your spiritual parents and your biological parents. But we know that the majority of us 
such thing does not exist for us. So what God has done, God has provided a spiritual, a spiritual one. And the one that becomes your spiritual father, it's not an overnight sensation. God kept them on the backside of the mountain. He brought them through the, he brought them through the fire. He brought them through the furnace. He molded them so that when you see them and experience them, you're experiencing the heart of the heavenly father through them why you think i keep on telling you ask god to show you who i am if you do not recognize a spiritual father here on earth you are fatherless that's how you know without a shadow of a doubt that you are directly connected. Because some people say, oh, nobody can tell me that. I am serving God. I know God. And No, no, no. You can serve God all by yourself. If that was the case, we would not have these scriptures in the Bible. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. John said, I write unto you spiritual fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And then he goes on and he says, I write unto you children because. Why would you think those scriptures are in the Bible? Why you think first Peter chapter five, Peter says, Peter says, I am exhorting you elders that whom God has given oversight over the sheep that you, that you do what? You feed the flock of God and lead them by example and do not be lords over God's heritage. And when he, the chief shepherd, come, he will reward you. Why do you think those scriptures are there? Many of you, even look, if you look at the ministry... Look, look at the ministry. Many of us are coming from places, and some of us go to places where the pastor doesn't even know that you exist. Because they do not have the heart of a... They don't even father their own children properly. Why you think First Timothy chapter 3 says, if any man desire the office of a pastor, a bishop, he must first be the husband of one wife and he must first take care of his own family because if he can't take care of his own family, how is he going to care for the house of God? House of God means... So if he can't take care of his own family... He can't take care of the family of God. That's why that thing is not for a novice. And women, everybody come now, take up position. God never purposed it for a female, naturally or spiritually, to father anybody. The female was created to be fathered. That's biblical order. Notice the first female came out of who? The first female wasn't taken out of a womb of a woman. Came out of a man. But even your husband, your husband, if he's mature enough, becomes your spiritual father. If he's mature. If he's not, both of you have to submit to a spiritual father now. Until that husband is mature enough, he is relinquished to now take that position. And the only time if there is something that he needs further advice on it, he comes. Because this covering is still here to continue to support that order. Come on, people. The reason why we see the church so messed up, we are not in order. We are all over the place. Ephesians chapter 4 says, as you grow up on the proper spiritual fathers, it says you will no longer be children tasked to 
and fro with every wind of doctrine. Some of us, this is how our life has been in Christ for all the time that we say we are saved. We have been all over the place. There is no place where we find any kind of environment to grow up. We just back and forth and we think that's what God, that's what God called you into? No. According to Colossians, you're supposed to be rooted and grounded. And for you to be rooted and grounded, you have to stay planted at a place for a period of time for roots to go down and for you to have some grounding. If you keep on pulling up and pulling up and plant and pulling up and plant, after a while that plant even end up dying. And that's what the devil wants. But I am here today in obedience to the Holy Spirit to expose the lies of the enemy. And those who have an ears to hear will hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The time has come that the children of God must grow up. And who is your spiritual father? You give them permission to speak into your life. You notice why many of us end up in certain things? We open ourselves to any and anybody to speak into your life. And that's dangerous. Because even in the natural, you don't want your child go out there and any and everybody. I give them information and I tell them things. No, 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 no. That even when they go there and certain things is said to them, it needs to come back and filter through you. Because there are times when it's not true and you need to bring correction to it. Wow. I'm still talking about faith. And let me go here and stop. And we, we, we observe the Lord's Supper. This I have been a part of what we call the church today for from 1987 April wow I did not think about it Marlon believe you me I did not I got born again April 1987 we're now in April. How many years? 36 years. Your daughter's age? Oh, wow. <laughs> 36 years. 36 years. Got born again when I was 18 years old. Green, green boy. <laughs> And I have seen things, heard things, experienced things where the church is concerned. And it's all come down, it all comes down to this. That faith is out of alignment. Because you see, when, you have, when faith is properly placed in God, it affects how you think. It affects how you speak it affects how you conduct yourself that there are some people that i came into the church and saw and they have died and even this morning while i was on my way coming my wife and i in the vehicle and emmanuel and we got to a certain part on the highway and this person just ah the reason why I thought about the person. Um, when I got to, in Caledon, Mayfield, and Chlorine, 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 Mayfield and Chlorine, right at that, that light, light red, and I stopped. And as I drove off, the scriptures 
that is playing in the car, the scripture that is being read is Genesis. So the reading was in the portion of chapter 6 going with Noah and the ark and stuff like that. And the reading got to the point where it says that the, 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 the windows of heaven was open and, you know, the rain and whatever. And as I heard that, I said to my wife, I said, this thing hit me that we used to sing back home in Jamaica, especially on a Sunday night with testimony. The windows of heaven are open and the blessings are falling tonight, but it's dear. It's joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made thing right. Oh, you know it. E, e, hold on there. I gave him my whole tattered garment. And he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on heavenly manner. That's why I'm so happy today. They would say tonight. That's why they only sing it at night. <laughs> and as, I, as the song came to me, right away. Have, have you, that ever happened to you? That you, a song and you remember certain people? Because the first time you heard that song, you were in the company of certain people that that song bring back. And right away, I remember a particular individual. I didn't say anything to my wife, but in my mind, I'm thinking, I said, Lord, is that person with you? Because this person was in church all their life. But along the way, I saw things that were shady. I saw things that, 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 that a person who properly placed faith in God should not do those things. And that's why. And, and right in the moment, Sister Kim, I believe it was for the first time since the person died. I kind of felt a kind of brokenness in my heart. Wondering if the person really is with the Lord right now. And we see a church that just... Just, just, just free for all. Anything goes. I make up the rule as I go along. Nobody can tell me anything. I know the Bible too. But we're out of order. And this message, when you talk about faith, faith is directly connected to order. Let me touch this and... And, and stop and pick up on it. In two weeks' time, it sounds a lot far, but it's not that far. Because <laughs> um, the Lord has laid a word on my heart for Montreal that it's still connected to faith, but this is not the topic that I will be dealing with. So, the two foundations of faith. Let's look at this one. I started it, I touch a little, and I need to, I need to, I need to allow you to see something more. Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, In chapter 1, we establish it, and I hope that you saw it. And if you didn't, I want you to look at it quickly with me again. The two foundations of faith. As I said, it's one, but I break it in two for you to see the importance to these two... Mm. Would I use the word ingredients? Ah. Hmm? Factors? Thank you. How important they are to your faith in God. And when you have these two things working correctly, it allows your faith to, to have 
anchor, stability, that irrespective of what shows up, you will experience some shaking, but you know that your foundation is intact. Because we, you, we all know that when we're walking by faith in God, persecution, things show up, and it, it, it shakes you sometimes. But if your faith, remember in Luke chapter 22, Jesus is about to die on the cross the night before he had the last supper with the disciples. And he said to them, you know, this night, one of you going to betray me, so on and so forth. And then he comes down further and he says, hmm, Peter, before the rooster crow this night, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, Lord, do all forsake you. I will never. He said, I will. I am willing to die. I'm willing to go to prison with you. Jesus said, Peter, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But remember what Jesus said? I have prayed for you that your faith will remain. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Satan, Satan, I've asked for every single one of us that are in Christ, there are moments when Satan asks for you. Can God trust you to hand you over and know that after you're a sif, you will remain? Because in that moment, God is, no, watch this. The reason why God will hand you over to Satan, not all of us are at that place right now for God to hand us over. God will never hand some of you over. Because you're not. Your faith is not grounded for you to be restored. But God knows that when Satan asks for you, and you are at that place. That's why teachings like this are important. This is not the kind of teaching that is telling you about how many houses you can get. That's not what faith is about. Faith is about knowing God. And when you know God, if you are in need of a house, God will give you the house. Right? When God hands you and I over to Satan, you know why God is at peace knowing and willing... Because let me ask you this. Why was God willing to hand over Job? Yet God did. Oh, you didn't pay attention to it? If God had not done it, Satan could not have touched him. Remember what his request was? He said to God, oh, he said, the reason why Job fear you, the reason why Job avoid evil and live upright is because you edge him. But he said to God, remove, watch this. Satan cannot touch the edge. He cannot remove it. If God put it around you, only God can move it. If God bless you, only God can move it. He says, he says but remove the edge and allow me to touch him and say, if he will not curse it to your face. And God says, Go. But one thing, one thing, you will not touch his soul, which means his life. Because the intent of Satan was not just to take stuff from Job. He wanted to kill Job. God said, you will not touch his life. So he noticed he went swiftly. He killed Job's children, kill his animals, destroy everything. And watch this, because Job's faith was in God for who God is. His faith was not in the Mercedes Benz because Camel in Bible days was like Rolls Royce. You know how much of them he had? 500. And after God, after him passing tests, God gave him a thousand. He had camels, he had, he had donkeys, he had oxen, he had, he had a lot. 
And when all of it was taken, because his faith was properly placed in God, the Bible said he ripped his clothes, he bowed down, and he said, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshiped God after everything was taken away. Can God trust you? If you lose everything, this one can't roll out. <laughs> if you lose everything, would you still worship? Something for you to think about. Because Satan goes around like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. If you're hearing this teaching and receiving it, it fortifies your faith. That you come to the place of understanding that worshiping God is not about what he can give me. I am worshiping God for who he is. I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1. I know in whom I believe. And I am persuaded. I am persuaded. I am persuaded. Come hell. Come storm. Come let the billows roll. They don't worry me. For I am sheltered in the arms of God. Job said... Though after my skin, worm may destroy my body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand upon the earth in the latter days. He said, though he smite me, yet will I trust him. Yet will I trust him. The enemy has been using your situation to literally discourage you. Your, 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 your financial situation. Come on. You're supposed to be going through things and Satan have to work hard to use it against you. Because he realized that, guess what? Even though I may be having some financial situation, that's not why I'm walking with God. So whether God take care of it or not, I'm still going to praise him. I am still going to honor him. I am still going to love him. So devil come as you may. You can use that to discourage me. You can use that to get me down. Come on. Even some of us, we allow our children to become a blockage because we see them. We see some of them, they're on drugs. Some of them, they're involved with gangs. Some of them, they're this and that. And we're so burdened down. Come on. Notice Job Ten children was killed. What did he do? What did he do? He bowed down and he worshiped. I promise you, if you start to behave like that, it gives Satan a hard time to find things to use against you. He comes and he says, okay, I tried the children and she didn't shake. I tried the children and he didn't budge. I tried money. I tried this. I tried. What, what, what must I? So he has to know, go and study hard to come against you. The three Hebrew boys, by faith, they quenched the violence of fire. That's in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, they quench the violence of the fire. They were in the fire. Remember before they were placed in the fire, what was their statement of faith? One thing we know, king, we're not able to answer you in the matter that you're asking us, which God is able to deliver us. But one thing we know, our God, whom we serve, 
is able to deliver us out of your hand and from the burning fiery furnace. And hold on, King, we're not finished yet. Even if... Even if he does not deliver us, we will not bow. What have you been bowing to? Turn it around. Let the devil know that your God is bigger than anything that he can bring against you. And I know that he's able. I know that he's able. But even if, even if he chooses not to deliver me, know this devil. I will not backslide. I will not give up on God. I will not turn to the left nor to the right because my God... We know that he's able, but even if he did not deliver us, we will not bow. A gentleman by the name of Andre Crouch, he wrote a song many years ago. The song says, I've got many tears and sorrows. I've got questions for tomorrows. There were times when I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation. <laughs> that my trials only come to make me strong. So what did I decide to do? Through it all, through it all, I've learned. And I've learned to trust in God. Oh, through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. So I thank him for the valleys, and I thank him for the mountains, and I thank him for the storms he has brought me through. For if I didn't have a problem, I wouldn't know that faith could solve them. And I wouldn't know what faith in God can do. So devil, through it all, through it all, I'm going to keep on trusting. And I'm going to keep on trusting. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. So I thank him for the mountains, and I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he has brought me through. If I didn't have a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I wouldn't know what faith in God can do. Oh, through it all, through it all, 
I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to trust in God. Oh, through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. The objective we learned from so many persons' lives that we read about in the scriptures. And not only persons that we read about in the scriptures, they are living examples that God have today on the earth for us to be able to look at and pull hope, strength, faith, courage, and stand in the face of any storm. Through it all, I have learned to trust in Jesus, and I have learned to trust in God. I've learned. Let, it, let, let the situation that shows up around you, don't let it pull you away from God, but let it push you. They push you closer. They push you closer to him. Push you closer to him. I think I need to stop right there. Let the Holy Spirit continue to work on that. Some of you right now, you're in this storm. Some of you are on the verge of stepping out. And some of you are on the verge of stepping in to one. Be encouraged. If you're in it, be encouraged. You're going to come out. And you're going to come out. I say you are going to come out. And you're coming out stronger. And those of you that are the verge, you are, you are, you're not alone. Even when nobody remember you, even when nobody is praying for you, God is with you. God is with you. So you're not alone. 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 I thank him for the mountains. I thank him for the valleys. In everything, give thanks. I thank him for the storms he has brought me through. Because if I didn't have a problem, I would know that God could solve them. I would know what faith in God can do. So through it all, through it all. I think this is a good point, a good place to observe the Lord's Supper. We'll come back to this. We'll come back to this. We'll come back to that teaching, faith. The Spirit is not finished with it. We're at, that, we're at, we're at a time in, in, in history of the human where God's people need to be grounded. God's people need to be grounded. Everything that is false needs to be exposed. And only truth must prevail. Um, 
Should I move this yet? Hold on a minute. Let, let, me, let me keep it a little more. Normally, I would do a teaching on it, but I said I've done, I think I've done enough that you can even go back and watch to get a full basic understanding of why we observe the Lord's Supper. The scripture calls it Lord's Supper. It was also known to the early church as Love Feast. Love Feast. And I said it a couple of weeks ago. If you notice, what the church, and, and it's so sad, the church has been tied up in so many things that are false and idolatrous. It was in March that they had Easter, right? Easter. Easter has nothing to do with the Bible. The Bible has nothing to do with Easter. Easter is a pagan, pagan concept that has been taken by the church and has been pushed on us. And they talk about Good Friday and all this stuff. The Jewish people, because we know based on even one of the teaching that I did, I went and show you the institution of the Lord's Supper and where it came from. It came out of Passover, not Easter. So guess what? Tomorrow evening, the Jewish Passover starts tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening. That's why I even deliberately choose this Sunday to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the Jewish Passover no, doesn't change from month to month. It, every year it comes in the same month. Easter. What, you, what month is going to come next year? <laughs> we don't need to follow these things that the Catholic Church has handed down to us. They are not representing Christ. I'm sorry, Pope, whatever your name is. They are not representing. It's a false representation. Jesus did not celebrate Easter with the disciples. He celebrated the Passover. And he, that very night, changed the order of things. Because when he took the bread, he said something that was never said before. When he took the wine, he said something that was never said before. And it now set the precedent for how the church would remember him. Remembering his death. And we're not remembering his death to cry and mourn over him because he's dead. No, he died and he rose again. And why we must remember his death. You see, there are things that that debt, that debt brought us certain benefits. And the first benefit is the benefit of redemption. We are redeemed. That was the reason, the main reason for his blood being shed. It was for our redemption. The, the, the shedding of his blood was the price of our redemption. His debt was the price for our justification. That you and I can be perfectly reconciled unto God, our Father. I have watched... Where people, they will talk about the death of Jesus. And we do, we just hang out and we talk about how he died and da 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 da. But yet we fail to come into the benefits of it. So Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So when we remember that he died, it's not just the debt that we should remember, but why? Why did he die? Why? That's where the power is. So in, in Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, watch this, being made conformable unto his debt. Unto his debt. 
So his death opened a door for you and I to come into God. Because you see, when Jacob was going to his uncle Laban, Mesopotamia, the night he took some stones and made it his pillow. He had a dream, saw a ladder, heaven open, angels ascending and descending. And when he woke up the morning, he said, this is a dreadful place. He said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know. He took the stones and he formed it in a particular way and he poured oil on it and he called it Beth El. Beth is house. El is God. House of God. Jacob knew that the stones was not the house of God. Watch this. The stone, the chief cornerstone is who? Jesus Christ. And the church is known as what? Based on 1 Peter chapter 1. Lively stones that builds up a spiritual house. Jacob was seeing something. So Bethel, house of God, is not a building. The house of God is Christ. And where we meet God is in Christ. In Christ. So when we remember his death, we must not just say, oh, he died. We must understand what did the death accomplish? The death opened the door for us, Jews and Gentiles, black and white, Trini and Jamaicans meet up at one spot. And we don't see each other as Trini. We don't see each other as Jamaicans. We don't see each other as Africans. We don't see each other as male and female either in that moment. We see each other as sons of God. And there is a pure Love, unendered, unendered. That's what his death brought us. It's time for us to live in the benefits of his death. Um, Damien, Marlon, Brother Patrick. Um, how many do we have? One, two, three, four. Is it four? Um, Brother Anthony? I on purpose look for this picture. And when I look at it, Sister Kim, there is the cross. But then the sun is rising. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new way of life that is now given to us because of his death. The morning when Jesus rose. Because the, the purpose of the cross was not for him to stay on it. That's why you don't need to wear a cross around your neck with the crucifix. He's not on the cross. If you're gonna, even, if you're gonna, if, even if I permit you to wear a cross, the cross must be empty. He's no longer on the cross. He's no longer in the tomb. That's why I don't need to visit the tomb in Israel. He's no longer in the tomb. He is alive. He's risen. You see the rays of the sun? Hallelujah. He's risen. He is risen. When the woman went to the tomb, when they were going with spices and they were carrying stuff to anoint the body, the angel said, why seek you the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Come and see the place where he laid. He's alive. He's alive. And for some of you, you have been going through a dark spot for a while. The light, the light of our risen Savior is dawning upon you. Lock on your faith to it. And know that even this day when you walk out of this room, you're not walking out in darkness. You're walking out in the light of his presence. You're walking out in the light of his glory. And there is nothing. Listen to me. Satan cannot eclipse it. 
Satan cannot eclipse it. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. I am the light of the world, he said. I am the light of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, Now in giving these instructions, I do not play, praise you. Since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For these must also be, there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore... When you come together, when you come together in one place, in one place, it is not for the Lord's Supper. He said, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and the other is drunk. What do you not have houses? What do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? Church of God is not a building. The church of God is each and every one of us that are born again. Do you despise the church of God? And shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus and the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He took bread. And the bread was exactly like this. We bought this from a Jewish store. So it's matzah. There is no yeast in it. So it's matzah. Jesus took the same thing that night and he broke it. And when he broke it, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And he broke it. Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, in the same manner... He took the cup, and when he took the cup, he said, This is the New Testament of in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. It takes a second for you to do that. It doesn't take a minute. It takes a second for you to do that. When you're born again and the Spirit is in you, it takes a second for you to do that. Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak, some sick, and many sleep. For if we will judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned. And God chases you through your spiritual father. 
When we're chastened by the Lord, so don't be quick to take offense. Don't be quick to lift a cup, take a barrier and, oh, you know, da da da. Know that because God loves you, He chastens you. He chastens you that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat the Lord's Supper, wait for one another. Wait for one another. Which means I have to be thinking about you in order for me to even wait for you. So think about one another. Think about one another. Don't let the person that is in here or the person around you be just a number. It's somebody that is important to you and you are important to them. Wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Did you all eat at home? <laughs> if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Lest you come together for judgment and the rest I will set in order when I come. So, Jesus, in breaking the bread, this is what he will do, and so I'm going to do that, and then the, the, they will come and serve. In the same night when he took the bread, before he broke it, this is what he would have prayed. Blessed art thou, O Lord God, King of the universe, that brings forth bread from the earth. And when he broke it, he gave it to them for them to eat because it now represents his body that would be broken for all. The cup, he took it and he said, Blessed art thou, O Lord God, King of the universe that brings forth fruit from the vine. Amen. I'm going to ask you, do we need, I think we need some more men. OJ, unpack that please. Um, we need two more men. Give one. So I've already done the blessing. Uh, Brother Andrew, come here please. So there is, hmm, I wonder if we could split it, make it a little faster. All right. And then, so you're going to take one of the, the drink and you're going to take a piece of the the matzah. Some, some piece break a little big, some small, doesn't matter. Don't just look for the big piece. <laughs> so, is that how we did it the last time? So position yourself, position yourself, position yourself. Damien, over this side. So it comes across, come back, and then it goes across, and then it comes across, and then it goes like that. All right? Two at the top, two at the top. Brother Patrick, top. Brother OJ, top. While they're doing that, let me also bring something to your attention. <laughs> those of us who are in this room, and those of you that are watching, oh, I, I forget to say something to them. I said it earlier, right? That you can find a piece of bread or anything. Those of you that are watching, join us. Get some juice. Get a piece of bread, something, and join us. All right? Those of you that are in this room and those of you that are watching, if you have children that are 12 and under, they can partake. Even if 
they have not yet surrendered their life to the Lord. Let me show you something. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, now concerning the things which I wrote to you, which I wrote, of which I wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is where sex is concerned. Now, do not de deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as occasion, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, not married and so forth, but even one, each one as his own gift from God, one in this manner and the other in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widow, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. It is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Then it says in verse 10, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who does not yet believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband that does not yet believe, if he is willing, accept that you have given your life to the, to the Lord and is willing to live with you, let her not divorce him. Watch this. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. This is where the children comes in now. Children 12 and under, under your supervision under your guidance they can partake of the lord's supper the jewish people when they celebrate passover in israel it's going to be for seven days outside of israel it's going to be for eight days they have their children around the table they tell them the story of the passover why it happened the children would actually say why is this night so? And they would tell them the story. And the youngest child, all of them is partaking of the, of the Passover meal. The youngest child at the table, when I did the first teaching, if you remember, I showed you how they would break a piece of the matzah. And they put it in this white towel and they fold it. And they give it to the youngest child at the table. If the child is five years old, four years old, they give it to the youngest child. And the child would take it and hide it somewhere. And that represent the burial of Christ and the resurrection. Because after, they would go and retrieve it. So, for those of us who have our children, 12 and under, they can partake of the Lord's Supper. Hear what he says here now. He says... For the unbelieving husband sanctify the wife and the wife sanctify the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. 
your children that is not even born again yet. They are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let them depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how, for how do you know her wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know a husband, whether you will save your wife? Do you want him? Some more what? Oh, it, it finish? Um, if them not have any upper top, then we have to multiply. We have to take back peace from somebody and multiply it. <laughs> they have more up there. <laughs> they have more up there. How many of you have children that is here and they're 12 and under? The thing now... Not just because they're under 12. They must be able to understand why Jesus died. If you notice, in the Passover, they, the parents would tell the children the story before they partake of the meal. As long as they're able to understand it, then they can partake. Oh, I hid peace in my rug. About two more? Too big? I'm a man in a man cut things big. <laughs> I think that should do it now. That would cover it. Yeah. We need more of that. Not as good for us to have leftovers. Do you have an idea of how many persons? One or two rows. How, how many of you did not get? You're participating and you did not get? Hold up your hand. You said one or two rows, but I'm only seeing one hand. Huh? Oh, you just got some? What? You didn't get any? Oh, you don't get any of the... Um, Brother OJ... Remember to let um, you get anything at all? April. And for you, for you, um, did you, you didn't get any yet, right? What was I saying? <laughs> oh, yeah, 12 and under. The last time when we had it was last year, right? No, we didn't have any. It, 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 it was last year. Last is right? And Emmanuel, Emmanuel was going to partake. He was crying. Yeah? Emmanuel, you can. Did he take any? Why? That was before I spoke. So now that I spoke, Emmanuel, you don't have to cry anymore. You can partake. Because the last time we did, and he said, he wanted to, and he said, why couldn't I? And I sat down, I spoke with him, I explained to him, and he got it. I said, okay, the next time you will be able to partake. That is what is important, that once they have an understanding. And do not underestimate your children because they are young. Remember, we trust the Holy Spirit to make things, to make things 
plain to them. It's not just you talking to them. So, um, Emmanuel old is Mariah? She's seven. Of course she can take it. Um, um, who am I? How old is Isaiah? He's going to be seven in July. He's six and a half. Cut off the half and put there. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah. Do you know why Jesus died? He died on the cross, yes. And you know why he died on the cross? Because of sin. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he can. He can. can participate. Okay. Um, who else did I see? Oh, Megan children, they partake already. Um, what else did I see? Um, Lakeisha, how oh, old is the oldest child? Seven? Who is seven? Is that, um, eh? Elijah is the oldest one? Why did I think it was Saniah? Our soul, eh? She had mature? Oh, wow. Elijah is seven? If he understands, it's okay for him to take it. Pardon me? Elijah couldn't answer? Elijah? <laughs> but do you think that because he didn't answer, he didn't understand? We have it covered now. So you're going to wait until I give you further instruction. Which one? It's enough. Is it far? So we don't need to. Anyway, go and join them. So now that you serve, I am going to serve you. Brother OJ say need some peanut butter and they. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we, if, 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 we, if we serve it with peanut butter, it's no longer large supper. <laughs> April, you got yours, right? Okay. So now, I think maybe this might be too big, but anyway. After he broke it, blessed it and broke it, and he said to them, Eat you all of it. And as you eat, you remember why his body was broken and you are now receiving the benefits of it. Go ahead and eat. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised 
for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Surely he has borne our sorrows and carried our griefs. He was stricken, smitten, and when they looked upon him, there was no form of comeliness that they should desire him. They did not know because they thought that the Lord was simply beating or striking him for his own sake. But he was wounded for our transgression. And I'm believing God with you and believing for those of you that are partaking, even at home, that as you take this moment and as you're eating the body, symbolically, this bread that is going into your body, as his body was broken for your body, right now every sickness, every disease, every malady, everything that is not of God that is coming against your body must leave now. Must leave now. Must leave now. Let's leave now. And as you eat, in the same manner, he took the cup. And when he blessed it, he said to them, drink you all of it. And as often as you drink this cup, you do show my death until I come. Go ahead and drink. That represent the blood, the precious, precious blood. As we read in Revelation 5, John said, I saw one as a lamb standing in the midst of the throne as if he was slain. And when the question was asked, who is worthy to break the seal and to open the book? And I cried. He said, I cried because there was no one in heaven or on earth found worthy. But the elder said, No, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's worthy. He's worthy. He has prevailed. He has prevailed. And so, as you partake of that blood, now you are affirming the truth that I am indeed redeemed. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I am bought with a price. Therefore, nothing in this world can buy me. No one in this world can buy me. I am redeemed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody go ahead and open up your mouth and give him thanks and give him praise. And if you can, put your hands together and bless him. I am redeemed. 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 Taken from the kingdom of darkness and I am placed into the kingdom of the son of his love. I am in the kingdom of light. I am no longer a child of sin. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am redeemed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 As often as you do this, it is important for us to do this ever so often because if we go without observing this, it leaves your faith compromised. That's why God told Israel, he actually gave it in the law for them to celebrate the Passover once per year, every year, reminding them that they were slaves in the house of bondage and how he brought them out. And if you notice throughout the scripture, in Jeremiah, in Isaiah, all throughout the scripture, when they do certain things, God would remind them how he brought them out. That was the most important act of God in their life in bringing them out as a nation. And so you and I, 
as we move forward in our walk of faith with Christ, be reminded that you are not cheap. You are not for sale. You have been bought with a price, and that's the only price. That's the only price that you will recognize and continue to submit yourself to. It is with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand with me, please. As you put the cups together and just send it over, if you are to that side or let it come back over to the... Do you know the song, When Peace Like a River? No. It says it was first written as a poem, and then years later, music was added to it. But it was a man that lived in Chicago when they had the great fire of Chicago. His business was destroyed, and his two daughters were away in England. And... He and his wife was in Chicago when the fire and his business and everything was destroyed. His daughters was on their way coming back from England and they died. The ship that they were on met in an accident and they died. And he decided to go to England after that. And on the way going to England, when he got to the spot where the captain showed him where the ship went down, he went back in his cabin and he began to pen the words, When peace like a river attendeth my ways, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The Lord wants me to tell you that it is well, it is well. It is well. It is well. It is well. Father, thank you for this precious day. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your care for your people, and your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Lord, for those who have come to visit with us today for the first time. I pray that when they walk out of this room, that their life will never, ever be the same again. And for those of us that are here all the time, we're a part of this family. Father, I pray that today will be a moment, Lord, that we have been elevated to another level. We have experienced another dimension in you, in your word, in the spirit and everything. And as we seal this day with observing the Lord's Supper, wow. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that as this image before us with the sun rising from the east and as the rays of the sun burst through the cloud, so it is, Father, that we know that the presence, the light of your presence is with us. It's within us. We have a treasure in earth and vessel. Father, may we carry that light and may we understand that we're not just to be carriers of it, but we become that very light that we are the light of the world so father as we go go with us be with us and continue to keep us throughout the week and father as we have been praying concerning montreal father as this weekend come upon us that we will be going there i know that you do not give me the freedom to go somewhere just for the sake of going father i thank you for what is already set to happen in montreal Father, we go as carriers of your presence, your glory. Oh, my God, your authority and your presence. And Father, as it is rightly called Royal Mountain. Father, as I go to be in that place, I pray that the kingdom of God will reinvade Montreal and spread out across Quebec in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and affect even other provinces. And Father, I know that people are praying and as they continue to pray, 
even while we're there, as they lift us up in prayer, we will be obedient to your spirit so that what you want done in this moment, we will not miss it. So, Father, thank you for what you have already established and said to be done. Let your kingdom indeed come and let your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. As we go, go with us and thank you for your precious promises that our faith sits on, knowing that you do not change and you cannot lie. The people of God say, Amen. the people of God say, Amen. the inheritance of God say, Amen. the saints of God say, Amen. the sons of God say, Amen. Amen. The last thing I will ask you to do before you go, and I will see some of you in, the, what, two weeks' time? It's going to be too long. But anyway, I'm going to ask you to do this. To the left, to the right, in front and before. Give the person a hug and tell them this is from Pastor and you will see him two weeks from now. 